What's up, y'all? It's your boy, Tyler the Gentleman. And for all y'all that want a piece of One Piece, welcome to Wino Peace. Get mad when I Luffy, boss up, who's me? Haters get mad when I Sanji, kicking it like Jet Li. Haters get mad when I Nami, that money come find me. Haters get mad when I Zoro, cut checks like Cora. Before we even start this video, I want to give a shout out to the Wino Peace Pirate Crew. If you want to be a part of the Wino Peace Pirate Crew, hit that subscribe button below. Do it! Be sure to follow me on Instagram at Wano underscore peace for Wano Peace memes, Wano Peace channel updates, One Piece cosplay, and One Piece fan art. This week we are recapping chapters 391 through 400. So, the Giants are whooping the Marines. The reason the Giants switched sides is because they found out that their two leaders weren't captured by the Marines and they've been here for 50 years fighting alongside the Marines for the wrong reasons. They thought they were gonna free the two other Giants from Elbath. They thought they were gonna free those Giants, but no, this did not happen. They were never captured by the Marines in the first place. This made the Giants mad and they started putting the whooping on the Marines. The guilty jurors took down Yokozuna the Frog. They kept hitting him with this metal steel ball thing and wasn't able to take it anymore and you know, it just fell down. As anyone would do if they were hit with a metal ball the size of a car. Spandam said the golden Dindin Mushi is the same thing that called the Buster Call to destroy Nico Robin's homeland way back. What we find out is it was actually his father who gave the go ahead for the buster call on Nico Robbins town. Crazy, it just runs in the family. Crazy runs in their family. So let's go back a little bit when Robin was eight years old, because I'm sure you all wanted to know exactly the same way as I wanted to know. So when Robin was eight years old, she passed a test to become an archeologist. So where she was, she passed the test to become an archaeologist. All the archaeologists threw her a party. They were so happy. Wow, you did it, Robin. You're the best. You are so smart for an eight-year-old. An eight-year-old archaeologist, she has to be smart. There was a 5,000-year-old tree on the island of O'Hara, and it was called the Tree of Omniscience. And people, for 5,000 years, had brought all types of books and literature there to share with the world. Basically, this place was a hub for information, for knowledge, for all archaeologists to be able to understand the past and present worlds. They believed it could be used to solve the mystery of the world beforehand, the void century. The reason Nico Robin is so valuable to the government that they either want her dead or on their side is because she grew up there and learned how to read in the old language. The old language tells of how to get the ancient weapons. The ancient weapons, the world government doesn't want anyone else to get them except themselves. So the world government made deciphering the Poneglyphs, they decided to make that a crime. Even as a child, Nico Robin wanted to study that, but the archaeologists wouldn't let them in a group to study it because they didn't want to put her at risk. Now what we find out is her mom was actually on a ship out going and searching for more information on the Void Century. Nico Olivia is Robin's mother's name, and she was one of those archaeologists that were studying the Void Century. She was on the boat, they were still at the tree, everybody's working together, synergizing, and you know, Omni science, some people, you know, that Omni is like all or everywhere, you know what I mean? Like omnipresence. They had an omnipresence because they have people at sea and people here. Now, when she finds that out that they won't allow, well, she didn't find out about her mother, but what she did find out is that these people wouldn't let them be a part of their group. So she goes kind of just running away mad and she meets a drifter giant named Saul. Saul says that he's more of a gentle giant, um, and not all of the giants are like the warriors of, of Elbath. It's just that since they are pirates and they travel around more, they are more notorious. His full name is Jaguar D. Saul. Hmm. Monkey D. Luffy? Mm hmm? Gold D. Roger? Porcus D. Ace? Hmm. Probably has nothing to do with anything, but... 
It's a lot of D's around here. Pause. Now, CP9 Chief Spandeen is closing in on the island of O'Hara, and he is actually Spandam's father. Saul realizes that Robin's mother is Olivia. So he kind of feels like he has to protect this little girl because he was on the same ship that Olivia was on. He freed Olivia from a marine base because he realized that what they were doing to her was wrong. The reason they locked her up was wrong. The way they just killed everybody on her ship was wrong. So he freed her and this relinquished him of his role as Vice Admiral. Now the reason he broke free of the Marines is because he didn't agree with the senseless annihilation of the archaeologists. Now Dr. Clover is the main doctor archaeologist in O'Hara and basically what he was saying is the Pontyglyphs, all the messages on the Pontyglyphs that are spread around the world were written in stone so that they would reach the future. The people who don't want the Pontyglyphs to be read are the world government so they may have been the enemies of the people who originally created the Pontyglyphs in the first place. So Dr. Clover was going on and on about that and he was saying like, hey, this there was an enormous kingdom during the void century or before the void century and just as he was about to say the name of the kingdom, he was shot down. This kind of signified the Marines chance to strike. So they struck, they started attacking the tree, they set the tree on fire, all these kind of things. And basically they were saying, you know, what you're doing is illegal, so you'll pay by death. So at this point, Saul grabs uh, Nico Robin and he gets her, tries to get her to safety because her mother, her mother was getting pulled away by the Marines to get taken to pr back to prison and Saul saved her. Nico Robin finally realized that was her mother. He was able to, I mean, finally realized that that was her mother and she was able to hug her and they had a quick moment, but that moment was short-lived because of the buster call. So what the archeologists did before that was try to get as many books into the water. So they threw books into the water. I think a lot of them ended up in some type of river or like, or a lake. Saul picked up an entire Marine ship and slammed it on a bunch of the other ships in order to help clear the path for Nico Robin. Now see, we thought before that Nico Robin was the one who destroyed all these ships. See, the world government, as we've seen before, they don't want people to know what's actually going on. So they said that Nico Robin destroyed the ships and that's why she has such a high bounty but that wasn't the case. It was actually a deserter from the Marines, Vice Admiral Saul, who saw what they were doing and disagreed with it. Of course, the world government can never let that get out without that someone they put in charge in Alabasta decided to try and take over Alabasta and the Alabastan people were saved by pirates. They're never gonna let those secrets get out and that's why they give people bounties. I mean, one of the reasons why they give these people such a high bounty to get rid of them. They want these people just kind of erased from existence. Okay, so Admiral Aokiji was there and at the time he was known as Vice Admiral Kuzan, right? I'm in between, because at first I thought he was cool. I thought he was kind of cool. He let them go, but then again, he almost killed Robin, but then again, he still kind of let her go. It was kind of confusing. And then we see him here again, just being annoying. He freezes Saul. Saul barely helps Nico Robin escape. And then he gets to Nico Robin. He's about to kill her. And then he lets her free, right? makes like a little ice thing and guides her ship to the next island. So I'm in between about him. I feel like he thinks he's doing right. And at some points where he can, he uh, breaks the rules or bends the rules where he sees fit. But at the same time, it seems like he's working with the bad guys. But I still don't know exactly why the world government is doing what they're doing. So until I get the full picture, I'm not sure who the bad guys really are. Anybody could easily say the bad guys are most of the pirates, but after seeing the Luffy pirates, they're a lot different. And then after seeing how the world government, a lot of them act like pirates, we've seen that in Arlong Park, you know what I mean? The way they treated people. And even in the very first episode, we see Axe Morgan. So it seems like the Marines are the bad guys. So I'm kind of in between with Admiral Alpiji. 
Okay, so they had this ship for the people that weren't archaeologists to get off the island, right? And it was just a escape ship. This had Marines on it, this had everybody on it. And what happens is um, Admiral Kanu, who was actually Vice Admiral Sakazuki at the time, he had his ship destroy that ship, just completely obliterated. So you have Marines who lost their lives on there. It really brings up that question, does the end justify the means? And I don't think it always does. It's all about the greater good. The greater good. I don't think it does. You can't just do whatever you want to say it's for the greater good. How can this be for the greater good? The greater good. You can't just obliterate a whole island and say it's for the greater good. How can this be for the greater good? The greater good. Shut it! I don't agree with that. As Saul was being frozen and he was trying to get let Nico Robin get away, he says, one day you're gonna find your Nokama or family. And I feel like she found that in the Straw Hat Pirates and that's why they had this flashback and that's why she remembered those words is because right here, right now, with the Straw Hat Pirates standing up to the CP9 to protect her, she actually feels like she's found her family. Now, we're back to present day. And they're standing off against the CP9 and Luffy tells Soulja King, to shoot the flag. So he shoots the world government flag with a fire star and it burns up. And everybody's like, what, what, what? Y'all just, this means this is a sign of war. They just went to war. They declared war against the world government. Straw Hat Pirates versus everybody. So Luffy just needs one more thing from Robin. He wants to hear her say she wants to live. Once she says that, the bridge begins to lower because all of Frankie's people finally, you know, accomplished their mission and were able to lower the gates. So now they're getting ready to get ready to go head on over there and fight the CP9. We find out that three-headed Baskerville is actually three people at this point and they break apart and Frankie also burns blueprints for the Pluton. I wonder if there's a catch like he has it in his head or whether it's actually that wasn't it. Because if the world government gets the ancient weapons, you're gonna need the Pluton in order to fight them. So I'm assuming, I'm assuming he has some sort of black backup plan and I really hope he does because you need that, you need that. So the three-headed Baskerville stopped the bridge from lowering but what they did is they used the rocket man to get across. Even though the bridge was kind of leaning up, they used the rocket man to get across anyway. So that worked out. Spandam pulled out a sword called Funk Feed and it just looks like an elephant. It's actually a pretty dope sword if you think about it. Cause you have the elephant tusk on the side and then the sword part comes up in the middle. It actually looks really cool and the elephant's face is the handle. Meh. Even though he looks like mankind from WWF way back in the day, he has a cool sword. Now Robin has Kairoseki handcuffs on. They nullify your devil fruit power. So she can't use her powers while she has these handcuffs on. So they're looking for the key to get her out of these handcuffs. Each member of the CP9 has a key. We don't know which key works. Our heroes have to go beat up all the CP9 members until they get the key. Luffy has to go and face off against Rob Lucci and stop Rob Lucci and Spandam from getting Nico Robin through the gates. Because if she gets through the gates, that's a whole nother problem that I don't even think the Straw Hats are ready for at this moment in time. Let me catch you up on the short comics. So Hina is fighting Mr. Two and she gets his leg trapped in her leg while they're fighting because that's her power. She can just make lock you in anyway. That's just her power, okay? She's the Black Cage. While the Marines were preoccupied with that, but Mr. Five and Miss Golden Week freed Miss Valentine. Then they took over a marine ship using a color trap, uh, uh, making them betray their own. They go to the marine house of detention and pretend to be caught, but we also find out that other officers of Baroque Works are here. We're talking about Crocodile, we're talking about Mr. One, Mr. Four, and probably the rest of Baroque's works are there. And I think they're trying to spring a jailbreak. We'll see what happens in the next episode of Wano Peace. But if you like this video, please like, comment, and subscribe. Also, let me know, what was your favorite part of these 10 chapters? The Grand Line is a rough place. You're gonna need a tough pirate crew. Why not join the Wano Peace pirate crew? Hit that subscribe button below. Thanks for watching this one. Peace.